Uh, why don't we move on? We've talked a lot about some out-of-stand analogs. These play a key role. Uh, there's been a lot of exciting new data that we just heard. Uh, there are, however, some older drugs that are also effective in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, Pam, can you take us through that a little bit? Sure. So, um, so I think figuring out when we when we treat patients with cytotoxic chemotherapy is important. I think that um, Diane mentioned earlier the use of um, streptozocin historically. I think it's not used a lot now in the U.S. Um, it's still used some in Europe. Um, it historically has been considered more toxic, and so I think reserved for later in a disease course. I think another really important branch point is really, again, back to the well-differentiated and poorly differentiated. So our patients with advanced poorly differentiated tumors, the mainstay of treatment is really still cytotoxic chemotherapy, and I think that the use of somatostatin analogs and biologics really don't play a role, at least at this point in those diseases. Um, so we would use a platinum, typically platinum-based, like platinum etoposide. Um, for the well-differentiated tumors, Tumors. So again, streptozocin is still, I guess, still the only FDA-approved agent, though not really used. There's um, some increasing interest, and in, again, temozolomide and capecitabine has been mentioned already. Um, a lot of fast adopters at this table, even though it's not FDA-approved. Um, we have a national clinical study um, through the cooperative group system of temozolomide versus temozolomide capecitabine um, in metastatic pancreatic nets. So it'll be the first prospective study really looking at that. I think that um, this was really based on a, some very small retrospective and um, uh, studies and small um, prospective studies that showed higher response rates. So these are folks that we would think maybe do have the bulky disease, rapidly progressive disease or symptoms from their disease that we might need tumor shrinkage. Um, TEMCAPE is actually pretty well tolerated. Um, perhaps even better than sunitinib, for example. Um, and I know some of the folks in Europe say they use that before they use some of the biologics. So we don't know yet um, how to sequence those, but it's TEMCAPE, I think, is not necessarily more toxic. I mean, you have a lot of experience not using TEM. I don't know if you have we do, comments no, we, on that. We, we definitely see, see activity with uh, temozolomide and temozolomide-based regimens. Uh, there, there is an, an interesting uh, theory out there uh, that for the faster growing tumors, um, temozolomide and other chemotherapy works, and for these really well differentiated slow growing tumors, chemotherapy doesn't work. And, and I have to say, I've, I've, I've seen it work in some very well differentiated yeah. tumors as well. Yeah, and I, and I think this also goes back to, I know um, Diane and her colleagues at Memorial are looking at this KI-67 again of, do we have the buckets right? right. And because that's really what we base so many of our treatments on, of the less than 20% K67 get treated one way. But I think, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, but. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we um, we also use a lot of temozolomide-based therapy, although I have to say we truly, um, patients do well on it in the short term. It's an alkylating agent. Yeah. Um, and so the long-term toxicities of bone marrow suppression need to be emphasized in that, you know, all of a sudden patients' platelets may go to 40 and yeah. you're like, oh. So I generally do not use that for longer than a year because mm -hmm. I worry about the bone marrow suppression and the rare but serious risk of, of actually MDS yeah. and potentially leukemia. So I think it's a, again, it's a real alkylating agent that we have to respect as such, even though it's pretty well tolerated. Um, and patients do get a nice tumor shrinkage, so they start to feel better a lot quicker than you would with a targeted therapy. Yeah. And I worry a little bit about um, the benefit of targeted therapy after temozolomide. There's certainly been anecdotes, but we truly, that sequencing of therapy is really unknown. And I think most of us have experience of the targeted therapies followed by the cytotoxics with nice response. Um, and sometimes you can see the converse, but it's still, we still don't know. So yeah. it makes me a little bit nervous that, you know, we do have level one evidence for targeted therapies as well. Um, so we want to be able to use all of them since we are treating it like a chronic disease. And so I would love to be able to have data to tell me the right way, um, but certainly we don't know that yet. Yeah. So going on that, Diane, being it's a chronic disease, how long do you treat? Um, that's a question that seems to come up in yeah. that, you know, these patients can tolerate this drug very well, and sometimes for many years, do you treat the maximum response? Do you keep it going as long as they're not I think just with temozolomide-based therapies, how long do you treat with that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I decided, you know, giving my potential concerns as an oncologist of, you know, first do no harm, and that the alkylating agent could hurt their bone marrow suppression, and if, you know, I wanted to give them something like an experimental PRRT later down the line, and their platelets were too low because of the alkylating agent, I was not gonna be able to, you know, sort of sleep at night for that. Right. So I stopped all my treatment pa patients after a year. And then something amazing happened. It kept shrinking. Oh. 
So I stopped the temozolomase-based therapies, and three months later, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but I had seen continued mm -hmm. responses of patients on treatment holiday. Um, I can't explain it, but sometimes that duration was as high as a year. So I tell patients that, you know, again, we're going to be on active surveillance again. We're yeah, going to watch you. Year on, year we're going to see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when you reintroduce it, they will respond. Um, well, I've seen that too, where they coast. They coast yeah. to a, yeah. to a, to a they nader. They do. They later coast on. and then they nader and then they'll sort of wait off. But I, I think that, um, you know, these are really important questions. And I don't know, should it be six months? Should it be well, a year and a half? And the, the and national then, trial was designed to expose patients to a year of treatment, sort yeah. of based primarily on kind of the way we used to dose temozolomide, which right. was one week on and one week off, mm -hmm. where the risk of myelosuppression and MDS was perhaps higher. Um, I'll say I'm not quite as strict as Diane in terms yeah. of how long I treat patients. I think we just don't know. I think that we risk exists. I've had patients on as long as you know, two-ish years, but I, I don't, it makes me nervous, yeah. but they're yeah. still responding. I've met and patients at support conferences that tell me they're on their sixth year. Oh, of wow. It, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how long do you treat, Matt? I, so <laughs> I, I agree. There's no consensus. Yeah. Uh, we did do studies with the dose intense regimen yeah. uh, and treated long term. And I will say we got, we ran into trouble uh, with a myelosuppression and specifically uh, with lymphopenia yeah. and opportunistic infections. So yeah. at this point, um, I usually stop after about a year as Diane does. I, I will also say I've seen the same phenomenon of shrinkage even after you stop. Mm -hmm. I think that suggests this has some long-term beneficial effects, uh, but also some long-term toxicities. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and the, the fact is, uh, unlike some of the other drugs we'll talk about, they really haven't yet been long-term prospective randomized right. studies right. Uh, right. looking at long-term toxicity, looking at long-term PFS. And I think the water is going to get muddied even further. We're, we're using KI-67 as a synonym for mitotic index and degree of differentiation. Yeah. But we now have, quote, well-differentiated tumors with very high KI-67 scores in pancreatic island cell tumors. There's at least one paper out of Johns Hopkins looking at a pretty large number of pancreatic islet cell patients, and their cutoff between a good prognosis and a bad prognosis was a KI-67 of 3%. Yeah. Huh. So what does that mean? What is it, you know, because we were saying, oh, you know, less than 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 20 is how we're kind of break things up in over 20. And that may but, also be the heterogeneity of the disease itself, that that one lesion may have been 3%, but yeah. there may be another that's 20. Well, yeah. and we have seen that yeah, in patients. Yeah. In the same patient, you take out a bunch of liver lesions, exactly and they'll right. have very different KI-67 right. scores, right. Yeah. very different affinity for an Octrea scan. Some are black holes with no uptake, and some are lit up, light up hot. Um, so the biology in the patient, there's intra-patient variation right. for the same tumor. It's very vexing. Mm -hmm. And Pam, your study is looking at some of the biologic markers and predictors. We are, yep. So we're doing a central pathology review to look at mitotic index and KA67 retrospectively. We're also trying to look at um, uh, biologic predictors of response to temozolomide. So Matt, you've done some work on this initially, but and we based our um, correlates on looking at MGMT, methylguanine methyltransferase, which is a DNA repair enzyme that in gliomas um, predicts that an MGMT deficiency res predicts response to temozolomide. So we will look at that um, both by immunohistochemistry and promoter methylation to try to get a little bit more prospective. Perfect data on that. that. Great.